Mr. President. I recognize, I recognize the Senator from Illinois. Mr. President, thank you very much. Uh, this Senate chamber has had a lot of historic debates. We've considered legislation of great seriousness and historic importance. I've been on the floor of the Senate when we voted on going to war. I can't think of a more serious responsibility that a member of the Senate might have. You know that even at the end of a good day, that innocent people are going to die. And you have to cast a vote as to whether or not America should make that decision. I've been here when we passed legislation that really was transformative in terms of the future of this country. After we went through the Great Recession in 2008, President Obama stepped up and said, we have to do something about reforming Wall Street. And we did. We spent months in committee hearings and brought to the floor a bill that was characterized as Dodd-Frank to change Wall Street and make sure we never went through that kind of economic crisis again. I was here when we considered the Affordable Care Act 10 years ago. That debate went on for over a year, amendment after amendment, change after change. We were addressing an issue that affected virtually every single American family, if not directly, indirectly. Those are the types of things that have been debated on the floor of this chamber. But look at it now. It's empty. It's so underutilized that for hours and hours, each business day, we come to the floor to make little speeches. At best, we're going to have a vote or two on another nomination from the Republican side, usually controversial nomination, and that's it. That's it. When you think of all the possibilities of what we could do in the United States Senate chamber for the good of this country, it seems like a terrible waste of space and a terrible waste of time. Men and women who made great personal sacrifices to run for the United States Senate and serve in this chamber find themselves in an empty chamber, by and large, with nothing going on. But if you want to see some action, switch your C-SPAN channel over to the House of Representatives. In that chamber, with a Democratic majority, they are actually legislating. That's right. On Capitol Hill, one of the branches of Congress actually passing legislation. Students ought to see it so they know what it looks like. Don't look here, because we don't do that anymore. We don't spend our time dealing with legislation in the United States Senate, only with lifetime appointments to the federal bench that Senator McConnell and the Federalist Society approve. Let me give you an example of something that happened in the House, an opportunity for the Senate. It's about the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act, passed under President Obama 10 years ago, really changed the way we sold health insurance in America. Before the Affordable Care Act, health insurance companies could, and often did, use people's medical history to deny coverage or to charge premiums they couldn't afford to pay for. What type of pre-existing condition caused people to be rendered essentially uninsurable before the Affordable Care Act? Asthma, diabetes, allergies, high blood pressure, arthritis, a history of cancer, or even being a woman. That was considered a pre-existing condition. Raised your premiums, maybe even denied your coverage. More than 133 million Americans out of the some 360 million in this country have a pre-existing condition. Five million of them from my home state of Illinois. I'll bet even more from the state of Florida. Before the Affordable Care Act, insurance companies used to use that medical history against individuals and families. The Affordable Care Act said enough of that discrimination against people who have pre-existing medical conditions. That bill, that law, prohibited insurance companies from denying coverage to people with pre-existing conditions or trying to charge them higher premiums because of it. For the past two years, President Donald Trump has had a single focus on eliminating the Affordable Care Act and the protections which I just described. He has attempted in every way possible to eliminate the protection for 133 million Americans with pre-existing conditions. Even brought it to the floor of the United States Senate early in his presidency, and I'll never forget that night. It was early in the morning, 
and it was a seesaw vote back and forth as to whether we were going to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Now, the Republicans who have been decrying this for 10 years couldn't wait to repeal it, but had nothing to replace it with. And so at about 2.30 in the morning, through that door, walked a man whom I considered a national hero and a member of the U.S. Senate named John McCain. John McCain walked through that door, stood in that well, and as he could barely move his arm, having had his arms broken as a prisoner of war, he said no. And his no vote with that thumb going down changed history. It kept the Affordable Care Act alive. President Trump failed, and he's never forgiven that great hero, John McCain, for stepping up for the good of this country and voting no against the repeal of the Affordable Care Act. But the president did not quit with that legislative effort. He decided he'd try to kill the Affordable Care Act and the protection for people with pre-existing conditions. He would do it in court if he couldn't do it in the Senate. President Trump's Department of Justice recently weighed in on a Texas court case and argued that the Affordable Care Act should be abolished. If that happened, of course, discrimination based on pre-existing conditions would once again be legal in America. In July, the court will hear the appeal of this case. If President Trump has his way, Americans will lose this protection if they have pre-existing conditions. It's just that simple. Last month, the House of Representatives, not too far away from where I'm standing, decided to do something. They decided to legislate. Unlike the Senate, they understand that houses of Congress can actually pass a bill that might become a law. So they had a debate and they had a vote. On a bipartisan basis, the House of Representatives last month passed the Protecting Americans with Pre-existing Conditions Act. This bill would prevent President Trump or any president from once again allowing health insurance companies to discriminate against people with pre-existing conditions. It would affect five million people in my state with pre-existing conditions and their families. Let me tell you about one of them. Her name's Kathy. She's from one of our suburban towns outside of Chicago, not a town really, a big city of Naperville. She wrote me about her kids, especially her oldest child who has diabetes and the other three children in her house who have cystic fibrosis. Kathy wrote, as a constituent and someone personally affected by cystic fibrosis, I'm asking you to please protect access to quality, specialized care for people with pre-existing conditions. Think about what that mom's been through with those three kids. Diabetes for the oldest, cystic fibrosis, cystic fibrosis for three of your children. Can you imagine the sleepless nights, the heartache, the worry that she and her family have been through because of those kids? Any family that's ever had a sick kid knows that it's a special pain. And Kathy has had it over and over and over again. To Kathy, I have to say this. The House of Representatives is here to help you. Sadly, the Senate is not. Under Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, Republican leader from Kentucky, the Senate is exclusively considering partisan controversial lifetime appointments to the federal courts and virtually nothing else, nothing else. The Senate should be voting on bills that would improve people's lives. The Senate could pass the bill already passed by the House and I could send Kathy of Naperville a message, we hear you, we wanna help you and your kids. We don't want you to ever have to worry about health insurance in the future because the kids were born with these medical conditions. There are other things we could do. How about this for a radical idea? Overwhelmingly, the American people, Republicans and Democrats, say, Congress, will you do something about the cost of prescription drugs? What have we done on the floor so far when it comes to the cost of pres prescription drugs in the Senate? Nothing. Every single day, if you own a television, you get to see nine ads by prescription drug companies. Some of them you can receive Re repeat right back to them. If you're allergic to Xarelto, don't take Xarelto. How would I figure that out? And you know the most heavily advertised drug? Humira. 
It's for an arthritic condition, but it also treats psoriasis. I'm learning all this because I see these ads over and over and over again. Any idea how much Humira costs? AbbVie, the company that makes it, tells you. $5,500 a month. Now, if you're crippled with arthritis, maybe that's what you need and want to do. If you have a red spot on your elbow from psoriasis, probably not. So I've got a bill that says disclose the price of drugs on your ads. Not a radical idea. And it's a price that the drug manufacturer themselves publicize. We're not making it up. Put it on your ad. It's one step, but only one step forward. There are so many things we could do to deal with the high cost of prescription drugs that we're not doing on the floor of the United States Senate. Instead, this empty chamber for members of the Senate to come and give speeches and maybe look longingly across the rotunda at the House of Representatives, which is actually legislating. What if we decided to do something about prescription drug prices? I think America would be in shock to think that the Senate actually is legislating. We just had another tragedy uh, in Virginia Beach, another mass shooting, 12 innocent people killed, several others seriously wounded. We don't know how that will end, but it's already a gross tragedy. It's been repeated over and over and over in virtually every one of our states. Could we take the time on the floor of the Senate to make sure that people with a felony conviction record do not buy guns in America? That's not too much to ask, is it? Closing that gun show loophole? Keep guns out of the hands of people who will misuse them? We could be doing that on the floor of the Senate, but not with Senator McConnell's agenda. It doesn't fit. He doesn't have time. We could also be reauthorizing the Violence Against Women's Act. It's a bill that used to pass so easily, Democrats and Republicans agreeing that we're against violence involving women. We're not reauthorizing it. We're not even considering it on the floor of the Senate. The Senate would be a great place to legislate. It would almost sound like the movie, or look like the movie, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, where people come to the floor of the Senate, elected senators and debate issues and vote on amendments, have roll calls, make speeches, appeal to the American people, try to put the majority votes together. Wouldn't it be a wonderful return to those thrilling days of yesteryear if the Senate legislated? But Senator McConnell doesn't have time. No time this year for legislation. Maybe next year. If he's in charge, maybe never. I urge Leader McConnell and my Republican colleagues, let's get back to work. Let's earn our paychecks. Let's use this chamber for the, pay for the purpose of which it was built. Let's actually debate a measure. Don't be afraid to vote by colleagues in the Senate. I've done it several thousand times. It's not that painful. I have constituents who expect nothing less of us. And when they see the Senate at work actually legislating on matters that are meaningful, they realize the Senate has become an empty chamber, a legislative graveyard. I'm ready to go to work. Perhaps a few Republican senators will join the Democrats in actually doing that. Mr. President, I yield the floor.